I knew as being on deck when Big Dave was the leadoff hitter, I might be forced to bunt, but it, uh, I, um, I'm happy to see that that's not going to be necessary. So conscience, practical reason, and the apprenticeship of love. As a moral theologian who sees his primary job as being an evangelist, uh, the, the great uh, fact that we have to address is the two great moral blindnesses of the 20th century. And I think it's important, first of all, to say that although it, it is often said that John uh, that uh, Pope Paul, with his encyclical Humanae Vitae, provoked a crisis in the church. I don't believe that that's true. I believe that when he uh, went off to uh, escape the heat of the Roman summer, that July of 1968, to go uh, as he normally did every summer to Castel Gandolfo, I don't think he had any idea of the amount of heat that it would generate. But he was more, that document is more like the person who smells something burning, goes into the kitchen, sees the lid on the soup bubbling, and takes the lid off. And he's not the one who burnt the soup. The soup was brewing for many centuries. And it's a kind of moral blindness. And the great twin facts of the 20th century that any moral theologian who's an evangelist has to confront is first, the universal global moral blindness with regard to the central teaching of Humanae Vitae. But that's secondary to another moral blindness, which is the moral blindness of a century that so easily slipped into mass murder. The 20th century has not seen, the, the world has not seen any century as uh, dedicated to killing the innocent. And even if you don't count the uh, combatants of the wars of the 20th century, just the non-combatants. It's in the millions. It's in the hundreds of millions. So the moral blindness that would allow, for example, uh, for, when I was growing up, who were the great heroes of the Second World War? They were the pilots, the Hollywood version, the pilots of the B-17s, the B-29s. They were the heroes. Well, Curtis LeMay, who organized the firebombing of 64 different Japanese cities where we discovered the way to incinerate civilian populations through creating firestorms, he said, had we lost the war, we all would have been prosecuted as war criminals. <laughs> Curtis LeMay saw the reality much more clearly than the romantic notion we were raised in. How is it that people who entered the war for just reasons came out of the war morally corrupted and blind to the fact that they were mass murderers. We shouldn't forget that the, what the, the uh, events that gave us one of the greatest uh, papers of philosophy in the 20th century, Modern Moral Philosophy by Elizabeth Anscombe, that paper was generated from discovering, A, that when she tried to protest Harry Truman getting an honorary doctorate at Oxford, only four professors joined her. And when she then was asked by Philip Afoot to take over her classes in moral philosophy when she was going on sabbatical, she saw the roots of the moral blindness uh, that was already at Oxford in the 50s. So we're also in an anniversary, the 60th anniversary this year, of that incredible essay, Modern Moral Philosophy from 1958. So the twin moral blindnesses and how to account to, for it. First of all, I think it's important to say it's not primarily about sex killing of the innocent, but the blindness that's involved in not being able to see the relationship between the unitive and the procreative in every conjugal act is a blindness that's much larger, the blindness to what it means to talk about the common good. What is the common good? It's not the conditions that are often described as the common good in uh, Gaudium et Spes and other documents, those are what the second scholastics would describe as the material common good. No, common good is my good, but that I can only enjoy with others. The common good of being a brother, the common good of being a son, the common good of being a, a mother or a father. I can't be a father alone. Those common goods, we are losing our ability to see them for what they are, our goods 
that we can only enjoy communally. So this global uh, blindness. Now we can speak and try to find the sources of this double blindness uh, in the rise of nominalism and volunteerism uh, and uh, our loss of our ability to understand what it means for God to be a creator. One of the most difficult philosophical notions to get your mind around is what it means for God to be a transcendent first cause, to create. Because something begins to happen in the late Middle Ages, we begin to lose our ability to see what, it, what the natural world is. We become alienated from the natural world. Loss of understanding of what our relationship to the natural world is and what nature's relationship to God is. A transcendent first cause. When the rose pr produces, when the rose bush produce, produces a rose, it's producing the rose. But God is producing the rose, but not in the place or uh, getting in the way of the nature of the rose, but as a transcendent first cause. When I act, I act, and God acts. There's not a, a, a fight of wills. In nominalism, do things have natures? Are there things that I am supposed to discover about the natural world? Or is the natural world just lots of little ping pong balls where we have goods that are either commensurate or they're not commensurate? So this fundamental blindness about nature, our relationship to nature, and God's relationship, uh, in nature's relationship to God. With that is tied that larger question of Zedekah, the just. So the call then, with regard to the truth of Humanae Vitae is to how to help our contemporaries see what they don't see, to recover from a moral blindness that they've largely inherited. Recovery of our understanding of nature, what it, is, what it means for things to have nature, the place of law within nature, and then the dispositions, the moral <coughs> excellences that allow me to love and live according to the law. Now, I've listed some people who can help us in this. I've already listed, uh, mentioned Elizabeth Anscombe, Irish Murdoch in her own uh, more platonic way, Philippa Foote, and Mary Midgley. All have things that they can uh, furnish elements for helping us to recover a notion of nature and the excellences that are proper to virtue. But I also want to say that this task is not primarily about conscience. Fundamentally, existentially, I can have a very well-formed conscience and not act according to it. So something is more fundamental in the moral life than conscience. But also, how does one form one's conscience? Conscience doesn't form conscience. There is something more fundamental than conscience, and that's the virtues proper to our practical reasoning, what the, traditional, the tradition describes as phronesis or prudentia, practical wisdom, developing the wisdom to be able to see the good here and now and live according to it. So that's our challenge, to help people to see the truth of the inseparable character of the unitive and the procreative ends, or the unitive and procreative meanings in the conjugal act. And not only to see it, but to love it so that they live it. Um, so if we're going to look at how one grows in this moral vision through practical reasoning, we should look at the more general question of the life of virtue. And to recognize that the temptation, the modern temptation, is to see practical reasoning just like a form of speculative reasoning. Iris Murdoch famously um, presents one version of this where um, you have reason, practical reason, following its own principles to conclusions without any uh, interference from me or uh, the interference of my will. Now, this, has come, this comes from Stuart Hampshire, and uh, Iris Murdoch is very funny with regard to this because she says he's very important because he perfectly articulates bad philosophy on these issues. <laughs> so uh, he presents practical reasoning like a computer. It, starts with principles without my intervention, and he says, that is, without the intervention of my will, it arrives at necessary conclusions, and then I, that is the will, and he says this explicitly, I identify myself with my will, I can either choose it or reject it. 
this is what uh, others will describe as the little man fallacy, the homunculus fallacy. But this is with us. This is the way in which practical reason is often seen. And it's seen because we want it to be objective. And we also want to say freedom. So freedom is associated with the will, and practical reason becomes a form of speculative reason. The problem with this is that's not how we actually come to act. Practical judgment is shaped by our, our loves. As Aristotle says, things seem to us according to who we are, and who we are is shaped by our loves. And so the call to form our practical judgments, it's like a type of tasting, connatural knowledge, the wisdom that is practical is kind of like a savoring where I come to see and appreciate uh, the moral good. The Greeks describe it as the kaulos, the morally beautiful, and to be able to identify what here and now in the hic et nunc, in the kairos, the critical present moment, what is the kaulos? What's the morally beautiful act to do here and now? That's the challenge. And that's the beauty of practical uh, reasoning and practical wisdom. Now, already the ancients want to describe the less evident by means of the more evident. And the more evident is by making analogies from uh, the arts. That is, uh, whether it's learning instru a musical instrument, learning a language, uh, sports, music, whether it's Plato, Aristotle, whether it's Plutarch, they all use analogies drawn from uh, the art, artistic, ours largely considered, activities. Famously, Father Pinkeris uses the two examples of a musical instrument and learning a language. Uh, McIntyre does something similar with regard to learning to play chess. And if you analyze the structure of learning these activities, and it's especially important for the whole question of learning a language if we are going to follow in the footsteps of the work of Carol Wojtyla. If there is a language inscri inscribed in the body, there is an analogous way of learning a language. So what are the ways in which we uh, come to learn a language uh, or the ways in which we come to learn a musical instrument? Well, first of all, there's a standard of excellence. You know, the person who decides to take lessons in piano Maybe it's because they've heard Art Tatum or some other great uh, jazz or classical pianist. And they say, I want to be able to do that someday. I want to be able to play Chopin. Uh, all right. Well, that becomes the ideal, a standard of excellence. But if you're going to do that, to do something you cannot do yet, which is play Chopin, and not just in some kind of uh, uh, formalist way, but with all the coloration and emotion that a real master of music is able to do, you then have to internalize the rules of music. Now, I had the privilege, I have the privilege of being able to collaborate and work with some famous jazz musicians. And one of the things that struck me the most is how often people misunderstand jazz improvisation, which is the, which is the uh, first cousin of Baroque ornamentation. You know, we have the letters of the um, parish, uh, head of the parish council to Herr Bach, and says, Herr Bach, we love being, singing uh, your hymns, but you're using so much instrument, uh, uh, ornamentation when you play the hymns that the choir can't follow you. So Bach himself created music while playing. But a jazz quartet, what are they doing? Or an octet? You have eight musicians creating music right there. And it's beautiful. Now, how is that possible? You have to have internalized the principles of music. You have to have internalized the jazz standards. You have to make that your own. It is by looking at the way in which rules function, whether it's playing a game, the double play. I never get to use this example in, 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 the, in Europe. <laughs> what has to have been internalized to be able to do a double play? It's not just the rule book, because there is the uh, customary law in baseball. How often does the, the shortstop actually tag second base? Very rarely. Why is that? Because the way in which the rule book is interpreted in the lived game, because they don't want baseball players having to retire because they've had a cleat in their knee, is that if they could have tagged it, they declare it as an out. He doesn't have to ruin his knee in order to get the out. And that way, you have the runner not trying to ruin his knee. 
So you have this whole, you have the rule book that's interior, interiorized, but every double play is unique. The excellence that comes from learning a virtue is not doing things exactly the same way. You know, living in Europe, one of the things you encounter sometimes are the old Roman roads, and they are ruts. You know, the reason why railroads have the gauge they have is because the, <coughs> the farm carts had a certain gauge in order to use the old Roman roads. And so it's a rut. The excellence of virtue is not a rut. It is generically doing the excellent act. But what the excellent act is, the kairos, in the kalos in the critical present moment, the kalos in the kairos, uh, changes. Every double play is unique. But you have acquired the excellence of being able to turn a double play. You have to, again, have a standard of excellence. You have to internalize the rules of the game. But in order to arrive at that excellence, you had to, at some point, trust a master. The person who starts playing piano, they, what are the, what's the first thing they start doing? They start doing scales. Now, being able intellectually to go from doing scales to playing Chopin is a huge leap. And as you progress, things that you learn at the beginning, you have to relearn. If you're going to keep going, you've got to play the note differently now that you're getting better. So you have to begin by trusting an expert. You need a magisterial voice, the voice of a master, whom you trust. So standard of excellence, someone who plays Chopin with coloration, internalizing the rules, you have to learn to play the instrument, you have to trust the expert, and then what happens as you progress? It's put into uh, the social context. So the person who's beginning to play violin, there's a little violin recital with other people at the same level. Or if you're beginning to learn a language, what do you do? You have little social exchanges you know, going to a cafe, and you have it all scripted. What are you doing? You are beginning to place the activity in its true social context. There is no such thing as being a solo musician. Music of its nature is a communal activity. Mm -hmm. And you learn it, even if you're on your own learning it, you're learning it in order for this to be a social event. And the same is true for language. Uh, and then uh, what is acquired at the end of it? I remember uh, I did a wedding uh, where it was an old Marine who was getting married, and he had never danced before, but he figured he had to dance at his wedding. And so uh, he tried to dance a waltz. And then the worst thing is they, they chose Viennese waltzes. And so this old Marine, he gets up and he starts doing, you know, he knows it's three, and that's not dancing, <laughs> right? I mean, dancing is you have to learn to internalize those three beats to do something that is beautiful and fluid. That's the freedom for excellence. Uh, the uh, liberté de qualité that Father Pinkers was talking about. Any person can make noise on a piano. That's the freedom of indifference. But in order to play Chopin with the coloration of a master pianist, you have to acquire a freedom that you didn't have in the beginning. And it presupposes a relationship of respect to the rules. The rules don't limit your freedom. They allow you to acquire a new freedom. Now, one of the reasons why the teachings of Umana Vitae were so massively rejected is this key point was not communicated. If you think that things don't have nature, if you think that the moral life is about rules imposed on you by the will of the lawgiver, then it's all about whether the rule applies to me in this case, and is my conscience in jeopardy. It's not about what's going to make me happy. I had the privilege of having a year of coursework, doctoral coursework, with one of the founders of proportionalism. During that entire year, the question never rose, well, what will make us happy? Will it actually make us unhappy? What it was, moral theology was about is helping not to crush people's consciences. He told us a very moving story about when the, um, we're in this diocese, so I, but when the, the cardinal of this diocese started to, um, in 68 to suspend any priest who preached against Humanae Vitae, a certain community uh, that was founded during the Baroque community, during the Baroque era, uh, had a meeting of all of their, of their uh, moral theologians from all of their universities in the United States. And what the meeting was about was, what can we do 
to not crush our faithful's uh, uh, consciences, not put their consciences in jeopardy. Now, I'll tell you, I grew up in a later era in the San Francisco Bay Area, in an era where it was, if, you, if it feels good, do it. If it tastes good, chew it. <laughs> our consciences were never in jeopardy. <laughs> the question was, why are we unhappy? What will lead us to happiness? What leads to fulfillment? All right, so the expertise, the living according to our deepest longings. How to apply that to the apprenticeship of, of love? The language of love. Love has a language. This is the insight from Central Europe filtered through Vienna because the, the ideas that... Uh, Carol Wojtyla has started to develop, uh, make their way. Uh, w w those of us who were raised under the Cold War, we thought there was East and West, but there was a Central Europe. And uh, Vienna was profoundly linked to Prague and Krakow. And these ideas were percolating before. So what Central Europe brings to Paul VI teaching is this idea of the language of the body. And it's a language you have to learn, but it presupposes that there is a structure, a grammar, some of the early work that the Krakow Commission, does anyone know what the Krakow Commission was? When Karol Wojtyla uh, was uh, newly installed in 1966, he uh, founded a commission in Krakow to study the question that was being debated uh, since the council. And they talked about those early documents under his influence, the grammar of the human body. The grammar, you have to learn that. And you learn it in a context. Also, it's not enough just to think it right, just as practical reasoning re presupposes emotional, what's now being described as emotional intelligence, well-ordered effectivity. So too, the language of love is associated with the music and dance of love. We have removed, you know, I had the privilege when I was a young friar working in northern Mexico, and the folks who were at the border they come from traditional cultures in the middle of Mexico, which the land had been used up. And so they come to the border with literally nothing but themselves. But what they hadn't lost is their song. Every weekend, they sang traditional songs together. They could sing together. Uh, they had meals together. Uh, this is where people's emotional lives are shaped. How do you learn uh, to love the good things in the way they should be loved? Uh, the angelism that affects the uh, married life is also affecting just how we eat. Uh, the medievals for Thomas Aquinas. What's Thomas Aquinas's vision of heaven? And one of the things, you know, what, Thomas is very discreet. He doesn't reveal himself. But one of the ways he does reveal himself is whenever there's a talk in his commentaries about food, he says a little bit more than his patristic, <laughs> uh, her, uh, per, than his patristic sources. It's a, celestial, it's a celestial banquet. Food is a banquet, which is a social communal event. The, the job of the Seneschal, for example, with, the king, with King Louis during the time of Thomas, was to figure out where everyone sat. It was a social event. Eating was social. It was not just food. We've separated food. And then we try to separate the pleasure of food from the nutrition of food. We want to be able to have all the, the flavors of food without any nutritional value so we don't get fat. Um, and we do something similar with the pleasures of sex, removing it from the larger context. So if we're going to help our contemporaries rediscover the truths that of the gospel with regard to the conjugal act, we're going to have to help them learn the language of love and to learn the dance and the music of love. So learning to taste and see the truth about the con conjugal act. First of all, standard of excellence. People are not going to find joy in the <coughs> Christian vision of married life if they never encounter anyone living it. Uh, they're not going to encounter it in seminaries. They're not going to encounter it uh, in nunneries. They've got to encounter it in lived families. 
couples joyfully living the basic foundation of the common good. You know, for the ancients, the common good existed on three levels. The level of the family, the level of the city-state, the polis, not the nation-state, that's a much more recent invention. The family, the local city-state, which was the city and the environs to keep the city uh, growing and living. So the, uh, the Italian city-state is the flowering of that vision. Uh, and then the universe, the whole universe. Those were the three levels. And we were in crisis with regard to all three. So the standard of excellence, the example of healthy families, internalization of the rules by living healthy courtship. I never forget when I was recently ordained and I first encountered uh, Janet Smith and she had just come out with a book 25 years later. I can't believe it's 25 years later from 25 years later. But <laughs> I said to her, well, what's the new thing? Because she was already, she was still a teaching at the University of Dallas. What's the new thing? And she says, well, they don't date. I said, what do you mean they don't date? We grew up thinking that dating was somehow like in your DNA. But being able, knowing the rules of dating was possible for my generation because it was transmitted from our parents to us. We knew what the rules were. We could have fun together because we knew what the rules were. The next generation, it was not communicated. They don't date. They go around in packs, she said. <laughs> so there's a call, therefore, that they're going to internalize the rules. It's going to be somehow by living healthy courtship, trust in an expert. That only comes if people are put in contact with healthy models of masculine and feminine love. Only they can speak with moral authority to be listened to. The magistri uh, for the next generation are going to be men and women living healthy family lives. They're the ones who are going to influence and lead people to want to follow in this, the footsteps. And then, of course, the social context of learning. Renewed social context of courtship. Meals, dance, and song. All the research points to the importance of this. I mean, there are reams, libraries full of research on the importance of meals eaten together across generations. There's a very, uh, Larry McMurtry wrote an essay called um, uh, Walter Benjamin at the Dairy Queen about what it was, how important it was for three generations of cowboys in his little dusty town in Texas where they would get together and talk, have meals together, the wisdom that is shared. I talked to my young students. I said, so when was your grandfather born? Or what's, they don't know. They can't tell you the year. They can't tell you what their grandparents' birthday was. They don't know because they don't have the conversation. For my generation, vivid conversations about living through the earthquake and fire of 1906. Vivid conversations about surviving uh, the influenza epidemic. Grandpa was kept in San Francisco not to go off as a corpsman in the Navy to fight in the First World War, but to take care of the San Franciscans. Three waves of the influenza epidemic killed many more San Franciscans than the war did. This stuff is transmitted because you're at the dinner table together, you're talking together. Um, so the social context. The other thing that has to be dealt with, and there are people working on this. Mary Hirschfeld's got a new book coming out with Harvard about this. The ways in which a lot of the troubles that we are facing is the strange way in which the Industrial Revolution has destroyed the working relationship between men and women. The, awry, the, 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 the modern notions of romantic love comes from the fact that men and women were no longer shoulder to shoulder, not eye to eye, but shoulder to shoulder in a common project, working together, where both of them, in, for the home economy, were essential. You couldn't have one without the other. They both were essential. Uh, what they were doing together. The biggest challenge, I think, is to renew that, uh, to <coughs> renew the way in which men and women work together. And I was going, I was tempted at the very beginning to say, this common blindness will require a way of living that I'm not sure many of us in this room are prepared to undertake. If we really want our contemporaries to, to rediscover the truths that Humanae Vitae has to tell us, it means changing how we live and, and doing the hard work of discovering another way of living. Because our way of living is deranged. Our way of eating food is deranged. Our relationship to the natural world is deranged. 
and we're, we've all been raised in it. Now, this is not anti-technology. I mean, anyone, any couple uh, who lives natural family planning, there's a lot of technology that's used in that. It's not anti-technology. It's against the abuse of technical rationality. So, the vexed, I've already jumped to that, the vexed issue of our relationship to the rest of nature. Plants, foods, animals. Again, the research all points to the profound way in which we are interrelated and the profound way in which how we act with regard to our natural environment affects everyone. Um, so I can't go into that here, but I think it's um, key for us and for research. If we are really serious about the evangelical task of helping our contemporaries to see the truth, to be able to practically reason about uh, the teachings of Humane Vitae, uh, it's going to require um, changing the way we live together. All right, now, some hopeful signs. I think it's important for us not to forget the context of July of 1968. The, that document was published in the waning days of the Prague Spring. And you could make the argument that the same false vision of the natural world was at work in the crushing of the Prague Spring at the end of August of 68, as was at work in the rejection of the teachings of Humane Vitae. And I'm not the only one who makes such uh, analogies. In the, in the early 80s, Vaclav Havel argued that the, that the surreal period that was put in place between 68 and 89 in Czechoslovakia, where you had a kind of totalitarian consumerism, was important for the West because they were in a hothouse version of what all society is challenged with, a false understanding of the natural world and our relationship to it. It's a very interesting essay. Those essays were collected in a thing called um, Open Letters. I encourage you to read them. Uh, Havel has important things to say, and that's why I think for us, uh, even if it's true that most of our contemporaries reject or simply don't see the truth of uh, the moral teaching of the church on this issue, because it is true and because our nature is rooted, our natures are rooted in this truth, there is hope. And Havel, as he began to develop, not in 68, but in 78, because we're at another interesting anniversary, simultaneously, unbeknownst to each other, and for different reasons. Václav Havel was writing his famous essay, The Power of the Powerless, in uh, October of, of 78, when a certain Karol Wojtyla was forced to start writing Redemptor Hominis at the same time when he was elected uh, in October of 78 as pope. And they both talk about freedom's dependence on fidelity to truth. And what Havel became fascinated by, after having first the language he gets is from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, but he became fascinated by his society's ability to live according to the lie. And there's something very comforting about living according to the lie. And it's easier to go with the flow. But the capacity to live according to the lie is only possible because it's the false alienated image of life in the truth. And the alienation that it produces, opens the heart, especially when grace is at work, to discovering a different way of living. And so Havel was asked, they were having secret meetings at the border in the, in the Tatras Mountains between the, the Poles and uh, the Czechoslovaks, uh, and there was a little bit more freedom in Poland so they could get their ideas out, and this famous um, Polish journalist was forcing Havel to write up his ideas. And so back home in that October, he writes up what became power, the powerless. And he talks about these different levels. The first stage is to refuse to live the lie. And he, he comes up with a, a different examples, like the, the guy who's working in the brewery, and the people who are in head of the brewery are um, party appointments, and they know nothing about making uh, good pilsner, and they're making it badly. But you're all supposed to uh, play along. Or the green grocer who's supposed to put slogans among the vegetables. And he doesn't believe any of these slogans, but he plays along. But the first step towards freedom is to refuse to live the lie, to refuse to live the lie about 
how to make good beer, or about the slogans among the vegetables. And then the next step is you start getting together with like-minded people to, know, to really cultivate fine uh, lager, you know, fine pills and lager, or to uh, work together uh, to produce uh, the best uh, grocery stores in your neighborhood that you can do. Little things where you refuse to live the lie and you start living according to the truth. That's where he says the independent spiritual, social, and political life of society is born. And John Paul II will describe this in Centesimus Anus uh, 46 as the subjectivity of society. And then the next stage, and this may sound familiar to some of you, parallel structures where you have underground arts academies, the theater was one of the few places that the government seemed to allow them a little freedom. You have schools that are not uh, officially sanctioned, farms where you start uh, eating food that's not chemically uh, produced or you have your own farms, athletic uh, uh, associations and gatherings that you do among your own families, uh, even restaurants. All of this in the American context sounds an awful lot like homeschooling, but in the Czech, Czechoslovak experience, it was ways for people to live together a parallel society. And then the notion of the parallel polis. Now, this has been bandied around in different ways. Some societies, uh, the government is, the people are so repressed that they actually do come up with a parallel government and try to become the legitimate government. That was the whole thing behind Valkyrie. Why did Valkyrie, the, the German nobility that put together such a huge network, they had to, and they were in cons consultation with Pius XII about this. They, in order to kill the, the tyrant, they had to be the legitimate government. And they had to be able to take over control of the government and be the legitimate government of, of Germany in order to execute the tyrant. No individual uh, tyrannicide. And in, among the Irish, the Irish, the old IRA, not the contemporary IRA, the old IRA, they were the parallel government. I know a fellow whose father was in the, uh, was a, one of De Valera's lieutenants, and he found after his father died uh, tags for. Um, registering uh, the dogs in the neighborhood. They had such a parallel government that they were even registering the dogs in the neighborhood. <laughs> so the parallel polis, but Havel and the people who invented this idea of the parallel polis was not a flight from society. It was not Catholic Amish movement. It was <laughs> to be a leaven within the society. So larger society like clinics, uh, there are food deserts in our cities where the people in the inner cities can't have good food. There are also medical deserts within our cities and in our rural areas. What a great opportunity to provide local medical care with a holistic Christian vision. Uh, hospitals, social centers, all of this can transform society. Now, of course, that's the positive way. Uh, Havel presents this in The Power of the Powers in 78. He says that this could lead to a peaceful transformation of society. We saw that. But then after Havel spent his years in service, he began to be, acquire a darker vision because he saw that in the day-to-day -day politics of being the president of the Czech Republic, uh, that it wasn't guaranteed that people would use their freedom that had been so hard won for good ends. And so he began to think it may require some terrible catastrophe. He was thinking in terms of uh, environmental catastrophe. But Alistair McIntyre uh, came up with a much more stunning uh, vision of this from Mechanical of Leibowitz when he uh, did After Virtue, uh, living among the rubbles of, of society. But because life in the truth is written into human nature, it becomes possible. So I think even with the catastrophe, uh, you can still have, as he says, a new uh, but very different St. Benedict. We can have new monastic societies, and I'll end with Benedict XVI, because that, I think, was what he was pointing towards for the future, new ways of Christians to live the Christian life. Um, we may see a pharaoh arise who knows nothing of Joseph, uh, but we know where that story ended. It ended in the salvation of the Jews. So we can end uh, on the, uh, the triumph of the cross, uh, that if we live life and the truth, we can help our contemporaries come to discover uh, the truth uh, and the beauty and the joy of uh, the Catholic uh, vision of the unitive and the procreative in the conjugal act. Thank you. <laughs>